I hope with that kind of report you are not disappointed by the end of the talk. I will endeavor to explain uh, the meaning of uh, Kabbalah, uh, the symbol of the tree of life, and why it is important that we study it at this time particularly. Not from a historical standpoint, but from the standpoint of its currency for our current times and days. Usually in the teachings of the Tree of Life and Kabbalah, we begin by a short, small exercise which is known as path working. I will make it very, very short, but it allows us all to just be here in this place in space rather than in the tube and wherever else we may have come from. So it's just a couple of minutes of uh, inner quietness and silence. For those that don't want to take part of it, just close your eyes and do your own inner thing. So let us close our eyes, bring our awareness to the crown center of energy just above our heads. See there that a funnel opens up as an antenna. And turning your inner eye to the higher space in the universe, imagine a dazzling radiant disk of light emerging out of the darkness. See a brilliant laser beam-like ray descending and touching your crown, entering within you, flowing through your whole being. Let your awareness withdraw into that beam of light. From it, see now millions of rays emanating in every direction, beyond your aura, beyond this place in space, embracing the whole of our planet Earth. We are points of light within this greater light, strand of loving energy within a stream of love divine, points of sacrificial fire within the fiery will of God, and thus we stand. Standing thus, we revolve and walk this way, the ways of men, knowing the ways of God, and thus we stand. Your awareness now at the brow of the forehead. You are here in this place in space. May open your eyes. Thank you. Let us start by calling ourselves to attention as to why it is important to study this esoteric system of teaching or education. The best way to approach this is to really bring an analogy. If you stand at the shore of the sea, you will watch that the sea moves in waves. And especially if it is a time when the actual sea is coming in, as they say, the tide is coming in, you will see that as one wave is crashing on the shore, another one is actually beginning. And more often than not, it is the one that is just beginning in the distance that comes a little further into the shore. This rhythm of the waves of the sea is also the rhythm of life as a whole. And so the evolution of mankind upon this planet follows that particular rhythm of waves. These waves, we call them periods or cycles or ages. As you may very well already uh, be aware, we have just begun to enter this new age, as we call it, the Aquarian Age. This is a major period of approximately 2,000 years, we have just come out of the Piscean Age of 2,000 years and entering the Aquarian Age. There are, of course, smaller waves, which are the centuries. And there are greater waves, which we call them the solar waves. These solar waves are actually of approximately 24 to 25,000 years. Now, what is important to realize is that at any time when there is this changeover of one century into another, of one age into another, and one greater 
period into another, there is a great influx of spiritual energies. This great influx of spiritual energies, of course, if it is absorbed, it produces great changes in the consciousness of human beings, which accelerates the evolution, the evolutionary journey. Now, there is a natural way of evolution for all living things upon our planet. This natural way of evolution is rather long, is arduous, and is fraught with problems and painful conditions. It is for that reason that the Lord Buddha said that all life is sorrow, because there is a lot of suffering in that slow evolutionary process. But when these greater influx of energies are flooding in, in these special times that we are in the midst of, then it is possible that human beings can open their hearts and minds and absorb these energies and accelerate their process of evolution. Now, how is this acceleration going to take place? By expanding our consciousness. Now, to understand how consciousness expands, we have to really again reflect upon the correspondence between the symbol of a tree and the nature of a human being. A tree begins by a seed being planted in the ground. And this seed, if it is watered, of course it will grow roots and then a trunk, then it will grow branches, it will produce leaves, flowers and fruit, and within the fruit is the beginning of the next cycle, the seed. Now the same suit is followed by the actual I am spark of the human being, which has been called as the monad, the one. It's a Greek word meaning the one. The one spark of the human being descends into materiality. This is the physical form, which corresponds to the roots of the tree. And of course, if we are watered by the spiritual energies, and as you know, the symbol of this great age that we are entering is the water carrier. The image or the symbol of this age is the water carrier. The water carrier is carrying the spiritual energies which are being dispensed by the greater uh, spiritual advanced beings upon our planet. And, of course, the more we are able to absorb these energies, the more we will be able to dynamically produce the appropriate changes to accelerate our evolution, to expand our consciousness. Now, what is important to understand is that this acceleration must happen at every level. We spoke about the physical form corresponding to the roots, the astral form corresponding to the trunk of the tree, the lower concrete mind corresponding to the branches, the higher abstract mind to the leaves, the higher spiritual emotions corresponding to the flowers, the fruit corresponds to the divine volitional or an, a, a aspect of our human nature, and of course the seeds are those great lords and masters who are the great teachers of mankind. So we can see that throughout history, it is not that always all the people absorb the new energies of each of the ages that have passed. Otherwise, all human beings will have attained the same level of evolution. We have amongst us right now, not in this room, but certainly within our planet Earth, people who are still at the very early stage of the root stage, let's call it. These might be the savages or the primitive races that are still to be found in faraway places of our planet. Then we have, of course, the ordinary uh, civilized people who might be corresponded to the trunk of the tree. Then we have the talented individuals, the creative individuals, who might correspond to the branches. Then we have the geniuses. And from time to time, we do have the genius who excel far in advance of everybody else. These are the leaves. Then we have the very few which we call the saints and the initiates. They are the flowers of the tree of life. And then beyond that, we have those unique individuals 
who sacrifice all and everything that they have attained for the acceleration and facilitation of all mankind. They are known as the lords or the masters, the great dispensers of compassion and benevolence for all mankind. So we can see that it is really up to us to open ourselves to absorb these new dynamics, these new energies, and accelerate our evolution. We don't have to. Nobody is putting a gun to you. You can remain in the slower river of evolution and continue to incarnate again and again. And at some point, at some time, you may very well uh, reach the stage of uh, the fruit, become a master, liberate yourself from karma and all the rest of it. But Essentially, it is important to understand that the longer version of evolution is full of suffering because in ignorance, we actually act in ways that are painful, in ways that bring back to us conditions which are difficult and testing. And therefore, to accelerate our evolution, it means to minimize that and also the great joy of having the expanded consciousness which brings in our inner world abilities and powers and ways of perception that are far in advance of what the average human being actually has now. Faculties which lie dormant within our consciousness. These faculties can be reawakened. The important thing about these current times is that truly we are facing the merging of this threefold change. We're having the change of the century, the change of the major Aquarian age from the Piscean, and of course the greater cycle of the 24, 25,000 years that I mentioned. Because of that fact, there has been a decision made in the greater spiritual hierarchy. This you can take it as uh, something that you cannot uh, confirm, uh, but something to ask food for thought. And this decision was made some time ago that they will intensify the dispensation of spiritual energies and attempt to bring them down from the higher planes all the way through the mental, astral, right down to the physical. And that means that our very genetics, our very DNA, will actually be changed and will expand and allow greater possibilities for our consciousness to manifest itself. Because as you know, evolution is a dual journey. On the one hand, we have to refine the physical form, and on the other hand, we must unfold the faculties of consciousness. Because if you have a very high consciousness, but a very low form, it is not possible that it can manifest those higher faculties and qualities. Therefore, the form needs to be refined, as well as the inner consciousness. And this dual process is required to be taken through. Of course, why study the Kabbalah at this time? Now, the Kabbalah is a word that comes, as you mostly will know, from the ancient Jewish tradition. And it means the received or to receive. Therefore, it is absolutely current for these events that are going on at this time. Because we must receive the new program, the new dynamic, the new plan in our consciousness so that we may begin this accelerated process of evolution for ourselves. Now the one unique thing about this time as opposed to other ages that have come and gone is because we're having a simultaneously a change on these threefold cycles that I mentioned and that allows a greater intensification of spiritual energies. And whereas in the past, we may have the highlight of one or other attribute of consciousness. In ancient Greece, we had the time of beauty and philosophy. In Persia, we had the sacred fire as the great spirit of the age. Even up to today, certain Zoroastrians are still holding on and maintaining this burning of the fire as a symbol of the inner fire. The Romans, in a smaller cycle, demonstrated 
the attribute of power. In our last century, we have demonstrated the power of the mind and its acceleration in the field of communication. And we know that communication has now produced the event and the situation where we are not in our own little golf fishbowl. Whatever happens in one part of the planet in the past, it may not actually be known in another part of the planet. But right now, all of us are able to perceive what is actually happening. Now, this is a unique time in the face and in the history of mankind upon this planet. Because of that fact, because it is a unique time, and because of the intensification of energies, which have begun from the time that electricity was actually discovered. And you know that electricity has produced light, and light is a symbol that actually dissolves the darkness of ignorance. And therefore, as darkness of ignorance is receding, so illumination is being accelerated. And as we go on in the next years to come, we will discover that the whole science, arts, spiritual visions, revelations will be accelerated, and we are living in these privileged times right now. You know what the glamour is in terms of much time that have passed when a particular event had taken place, let us say the Buddha event or the Christ event, and people often may think, if I were there at the time, perhaps I would have been open, perhaps I would have absorbed, I would have been a servant of the light. Well, you are right now in the very midst of such events, great events. And as I said, whereas before, the highlight was with one or other attribute of our consciousness, right now, it is a synthesis of all the attributes of consciousness. The energies will actually accelerate and expand all the attributes of consciousness simultaneously. If we are to understand that, and if we are to see why the study of the Kabbalah can actually allow us to accelerate this process, then we must reflect upon the symbolism of the actual tree and what that actually means then in our particular nature. We must learn to understand that when a change is imminent and it's happening, then in our consciousness we must make a certain decision. On the one hand, we must let go, shed away all that does not belong with the next phase of our evolution. And on the other hand, actually be open to absorb the dynamic and the plan of that new phase of our evolution. What does that actually mean practically for us? It means that we have to study our own attributes of consciousness. We have to study our different worlds of our uh, constitution. And we also have to study the different aspects of our consciousness, the different faculties, let's call them, abilities, and refine them. It's very important to see that these three attributes of consciousness, which we might call the will, the love wisdom, and the creative intelligence, at different stages of human evolution, one human being may have concentrated on developing his intelligence. At another time, he may have concentrated his efforts in unfolding the loving principle in himself. At another time, he may have concentrated on unfolding the will principle. That is why we have amongst us people who are more volitional, i.e. more uh, demonstrating their power, and others who are more intellectual, and others who are more loving, more devotional types. Now, this is very, very important because a man of power will not respect a person of the loving type because they will see them as weak, especially if the man of power is actually immature. An immature man of power will demonstrate boastfulness in his achievements, will be like a little dictator, will uh, want to push everybody about, and even in the uh, schoolyard, he will always be the little bully. And then later on, this same attitude is taken in the actual boardroom, and further on in the bedroom, and so on and so on. 
It is true. But of course, a very much more mature type of the power kind will manifest the spirit of authority without being authoritative. He will actually manifest the quality of humility and he will allow others to succeed and provide his energies as a sacrifice so that others may go forward. A love type person who is immature will actually suffer the consequences of being sentimental. He may also or she may also become uh, very liberal with their uh, uh, love and their emotions and seek to find love perhaps through sexual indulgence and sexual experimentation. But a more advanced love type will be one who embraces with their consciousness, compassion, and is able to do what needs to be done at the time that it needs to be done, whether they like doing it or not. The intellectual type in the earlier stages has enough intelligence to know what is actually wrong in the part, but not enough intelligence to see what is good in the whole. They end up become critics, critics of art, critics of uh, um, writings, of books, of films, and so on. They have enough intelligence to criticize every, o- every other produce, but not enough to actually analyze their own uh, nature and improve it and refine it. But of course, a more advanced intellectual type will place his intellect in service to humanity will produce a philosophy that is good, that is true, may apply his intellect to uh, invent something that will be useful for all mankind in the medical world or in the communication world, in whatever other world he may be concentrating in. So these three particular major types of our consciousness are reflected in these three what are known as actual pillars of the tree of life. So we are actually talking about Kabbalah, even though we are approaching it from this standpoint. So these three pillars are, if you like, the three major ways, the way of the love type, the way of the intellectual type, and the way of the volitional type. There are also other names that are given by um, Kabbalists to these three pillars. They are known as the pillar of form. This is actually that pillar. The pillar of force, this pillar. And the pillar of synthesis and equilibrium, that pillar. These are also the three divine attributes of universal consciousness, which we might term them as the energizing principle, the cohesive principle, and the differentiating principle. Now, the differentiating principle is responsible for all the different species, the different races, the different nationalities, and so on, in the world as we know it. The cohesive principle is also the attractive principle that truly holds everything together. If the cohesive principle is withdrawn from your physical body, then the body begins to disintegrate and fall apart. It is by virtue of the cohesive principle that is within you. Cohesion means union, holding together, yes? So it is important to see that these three divine attributes of our consciousness are present in everything, in the physical dimension as well as in every other dimension all the way to the highest. In the physical atom, we have atomic consciousness. And within the atom, we have the nucleus of the proton, electron, and neutron. Of course, again, this threefold aspect. These three divine attributes of human consciousness require to be brought into equilibrium. And what Pythagoras in ancient times spoke of is to equal, equal, what's the right word? Equilateralize the triangle. The triangle meaning the divine will, the divine love, and the divine intelligence in oneself. When these three are equally unfolded, then a human being can manifest through his nature the will to good, 
the love that embraces all in oneness, and the creative intelligence that really is true and unfolds a true philosophy. So each and every one of us has this possibility right now, as we stand here, to open our minds and our hearts to absorb these dynamics, not only in our consciousness as information, but actually in our very astral, mental, physical natures, and produce this change, produce this expansion of our DNA that will unfold the kind of responsiveness in form, in matter, that our consciousness can make use of and liberate the greater faculties that we know great initiates, masters, and saints actually have. Faculties such as healing, faculties of direct spiritual perception, which is known as intuition or clear seeing or whatever. Faculties of being able to interpret the plan accurately, because there is a plan. The plan is not arbitrary. The will energy is actually responsible for the manifestation of archetypal designs. You do know, do you know, that everything in the world follows a particular design. Plato said the fulfillment of perfection for any living thing is truly the fulfillment of its inherent potentiality. And that potentiality lies within its design, within its essential blueprint. And each one of us has that design. But you know, maybe we have lost the manual of how to actually work the design. You know, when people design clothes, they have uh, an actual print, and then they follow the print and cut the material accordingly. What is the human design? Have we ever thought that truly there is an archetypal human design? And if we were able to realize what that might be and follow it appropriately, then indeed a lot of our troubles and pains and suffering will disappear and dissolve. And our relationships will be of a higher quality. Throughout the ages, the great teachers have endeavored to highlight different aspects of that archetypal design. But who was listening? Maybe very few. Are we listening right now? I'm not claiming to be anybody. I'm just simply a speaker. Forget the speaker. Absorb the message. The message is calling you to attention, to awaken your mind, to bring in alignment your emotional energy, and to invest the will purposefully to really begin this process of accelerating your consciousness and shedding away all the unnecessary elements which no longer belong in the next phase. And we all know what they are. So we have to actually produce refinement in the four worlds, as the Kabbalists call them. I have spoken about the three pillars. I'm only giving a gentle introduction, yes? The three pillars are these. Now, every sphere and every pathway that we see on this symbol also has within it a fourfold world. These four worlds are also in our human tree, not only in the cosmic tree. We call them the physical world. We call them the astral or uh, emotional world. We call it the intellectual world, the moral world, and the volitional world. So refinement requires to happen in this fourfold world of our nature. If we are truly to begin this accelerated process. These four worlds are known in the Kabbalistic sense as the world of emanations. Now the world of emanations, that suggests the world of origins. Within it is veiled the principle of oneness. In other words, all and every intelligence, however advanced or lowly it may be, 
all hierarchy of intelligences, in other words, have their source in that world. They emanate from that world. The second world is the world of archetypal designs known as the creative world. Within those archetypal designs, there is truly the appropriate means of how a human being is to conduct himself in his relationships with every other human being. But of course, who is listening? Who is listening and who is absorbing the dynamic of those archetypal designs? The virtues which are cultivated have their origin in that creative moral world. So the study of moral virtues, the study of sociology, the study of human relationships belongs in that world. And as we cultivate ever better human relationships, so we, do we unfold our consciousness in that world. The next world is the realm of formations, the realm of formations. Within it is veiled the whole principle of evolution. For all forms veil the hidden light. All forms veil the hidden light. Forms are only the outer and visible sign of that invisible reality that lives within the form. So we look a human being at the outer form and we make a judgment. And of course, we do not have the eyes to see the inner presence, the intelligence, the love, the will, the divine spark that exists there. And it is important that we see each other, not only as physical forms, but really go beyond the outer appearance and touch the essence of who we are. The Lord Christ said, I am the light of the world. And indeed, every human being is the light of his world of his particular form. And the sooner we realize that we are beams of light, sparks of divine consciousness, the more we will accelerate our refining process and the cultivation of better human relationships. The four world is the world of appearances or the world of manifestations or the world of expression. Within that is veiled the principle of periodicity that we have spoken about, the principle of incarnation and discarnation, because all forms are actually temporary. When they serve their useful purpose, they are outlived their usefulness, and they grow old, and they die. The intelligence withdraws and reemerges in another form, and that form offers it a better opportunity to manifest itself. So this whole journey of evolution is moving onwards. And it is important that we actually see that each one of us needs to take in hand this fourfold nature and begin the refining process, begin the evaluation process of what qualities within it belong to the next phase and what qualities need to be transmuted. So, we require to really, on the first step, purity and refinement is the foundation of every true system of education. Unfortunately, education in the ordinary schools and universities fails human consciousness because it does not focus its attention on the whole human being. It focuses its attention on just creating a good computer, a good vast memory. If in the exams you can actually provide the half answers that they are asking you, then you are a very intelligent human being. If you cannot, then you are not. So because they focus their attention too much on that intellectual element, and do not incorporate the volitional, the moral, and the whole nature of the human being, and do not actually synthesize 
and give means and ways by which we can truly refine our nature in an active and practical way, that kind of education is useful because it allows us to have careers. It's also useful because it does, in the end, generate some activity in the gray matter. And it does wake it up a little bit. But we do require to take our nature in hand and accelerate this education in a broader sense. What is the purpose of any education, of anything? Surely it must be so that we are better prepared to face the challenge of life, is it not? Well, so much more esoteric education is so that we can fulfill our inherent potentiality, so that we can actually realize our divinity, so that we can manifest the will to good, the love that beautifies everything, and the intelligence that reveals truth, and a philosophy that is in harmony with the natural laws of universal life. Why do they not teach us the actual universal laws in ordinary schools? Because, you know, if we understood the universal laws, which is another aspect that in the teachings of the Kabbalah we study, then if there are such principles as universal laws, then everything that falls within the domain of these laws can be understood and be explained by those laws. It is for that reason that wise human beings and sages always proclaim statements and things that science only later comes to prove because they understand the laws. They do not have to go into an experiment in a laboratory to prove one thing or another. They know that this law is universal, perfect, and therefore all and everything that falls under it will indeed explain X or Y phenomena. So we must go beyond the phenomena of life to really understand what life is. The phenomena is the appearance, is the outer, the temporary world. We must see the forms as veiling that light and look for that light. And then also ask the question, what is the origin of that light? What is the source of that light? And aim to touch that source and unite with our own source. This whole process of tracing everything from the outer appearance to the inner source, it is known in the teachings of the Tree of Life as the study of symbols. For everything is a symbol, is it not? The human form is a symbol, a flower is a symbol, a triangle is a symbol, a square is a tree symbol, a pyramid is a symbol. God, Plato says, geometrizes himself in the universe. So we have mathematics, numbers, which are actually the laws that govern all happenings in manifested existence. And we have geometry, which is actually the shaping of the forms. And when we speak of forms, we can speak of minor forms that we create, human forms, or we might speak of heavenly bodies, of solar systems, of galaxies. So it is the same principle all the way through. So essentially, it is important that we all appreciate the study of symbology as a journey of traveling from the outer worlds into the inner worlds of realizations. And that if we see everything as a symbol that veils that hidden reality, then by attempting to touch that hidden reality, we are actually awakening brain cells in our head. Science tells us that we are only using a very small part of our brain. How that other part is going to come into use, if not by us attempting to actually bring greater intensity of energy? Nothing can happen in the absence of energy. Have you ever realized that? I'm sure you have. Everything requires energy to function, to move, to do whatever it has to do. And so the brain to unfold the greater faculties requires greater energy. That energy is actually brought about as we focus our attention on attempting to understand what might be beyond our concrete memory intelligence. 
we have to realize that really there are two kinds of knowledge. There is the knowledge that is acquired through history. Knowledge by acquisition. And then there is knowledge by revelation. The knowledge by acquisition forms the horizontal bar of the cross. The knowledge by revelation is the vertical bar of the cross. And if we are to truly bring about this expansion of consciousness, we have to focus our attention on the center of the cross, where the two meet. I am not suggesting that we must shed away and make unimportant the knowledge of the acquired knowledge through study, through remembrance, and through experience. No. But in the absence of that revelational knowledge, we only have a very small part of what is real, of the whole. And in the absence of the whole, there is imperfection. And in the presence of an imperfect philosophy in our minds, there will be imperfect action. And in the presence of imperfect actions, we have suffering of one kind or another. So I'm outlining simple ways by which truly we can begin to cultivate better human relationships. We must realize our vertical heritage as well as our horizontal heritage, to put it in other terms. Our horizontal heritage has to do with what we have taken from history, from our father, from mother, genetically, and from our education in schools, in uh, the culture in which we are born, in the nationality and race which we are born. True, we take the best of that. But then we must begin to turn our inner eye towards that invisible source and acknowledge that it is present. I promise you, just to do this simple act each and every day, when you begin your day to say, I am now in the present, I am now in the present, to call forth the presence of the I am in you in the here and now, and to acknowledge that, to acknowledge that vertical spiritual heritage is to begin the process of aligning yourself to this vertical descent from which you can have moments of illumination. Moments of illumination which in one flash reveal a vast array of truths by those who become inspired that they saw in a flash a whole musical symphony. And then it took them the time to actually materialize it in the physical world. It is true. You can, uh, in a flash of inspiration, perceive a beautiful piece of music. But if the fingers haven't been trained to play the piano, you can try and nothing is coming out. It's in your head, but you can't actually externalize it. That is why it's absolutely vital that the form is also refined and trained and highly tuned, as well as the inner consciousness. You cannot have a super magnificent engine in a very small, rather frail car. It's the same with the human constitution. So it is important that we see that altogether we have at this time a perfect opportunity to accelerate this whole journey of our evolution by taking in hand our natures and beginning the appropriate study of our moral world, of our intellectual world, and our physical actions, as well as the appropriate use of the will. The will, you know, has been misused in many, many different ways. To exploit man, to suppress man, to limit the freedom of man, and the expansion of consciousness, another way for it is to say freedom, liberation, and consciousness liberates itself from limitations. Ignorance is a limitation. Yes? Ignorance is a limitation. By virtue of that limitation, by virtue of that ignorance, so many great human beings have used their will in inappropriate ways. Another element that we have to consider is timing. We spoke about the 
the analogy of the waves. If you have gone swimming, you will know that if you, if you have big waves and you catch the wave at the wrong angle, the wrong timing in other words, you get turned over and you get hit down in the ground and you might have a problem if you're not a very good swimmer. But if you can just catch the wave in the appropriate timing, then you touch it on the crest of the wave instead of the trough and you are carried over. We are having right now a crest of a wave. Let us all wake up and align ourselves to that crest of the wave and ride over it and truly accelerate our journey of evolution. It is possible to everyone. This is the unique event. Whereas in the past, it was for the selected few that managed to enter an esoteric school. Right now, the esoteric knowledge is being externalized. The externalization of wisdom has already begun, and it will be accelerating ongoingly. You will come to see in your lifetime events that now, if I speak about them, you will see and say, oh, science fiction. But it will come to pass as absolute truths. Yes. Teleportation will come to be a reality. Yes, continuity of consciousness will come to be a reality. And I mean by continuity of consciousness that we shudder the veil that has created so much suffering of thinking that this life is the only life and when we snuff it, so to speak, that's it. You either go to heaven or you go to hell. That is not it. All you have actually lost is your physical outer visible vehicle of manifestation but you still are and so that veil will actually be shattered we will have recordings in due course of beings like you and I who when we leave our physical form still exist and are able to communicate we will devise instruments that are fine enough to actually record that energy and translate it in language that we can actually understand. Already there are people who are known as clairvoyants able to do that, mediums and uh, mediators and all the rest of it. This will become the property of all mankind in due course. And this whole process of continuity of consciousness is accelerating. When we go to sleep, we have experience in that realm. But when we wake up, most of us do not remember. We don't have that link of establishment of continuity of consciousness. Some of us do. It is important to be aware that truly we have the opportunity to manifest in our nature that essential divine quality that we are and express it in all our relationships. And the work is quite effortless when you have the inner realization of what we are talking about. These four worlds are not only present in just the teachings of the Tree of Life. They are represented in the Christian faith by the four Gospels, Mark, Luke, John, and Matthew. In the Buddhist religion, we have the four noble truths of the Buddha, and they also have to do with that whole four-world nature of the human being and of our world. In the old faith of Hinduism, they have it there too, the four castes. In the Muslim religion, we have the four great archangels, Mikael, Gabriel, Uriel, who have I missed? Raphael. Forgive me, Raphael. It is important to see that truly Kabbalah is not a religion. It is a living system of education, current today as it ever was, appropriate today to study, to live it as it ever was. It is the source from which so many other teachings have sprung. It is the perennial wisdom, it is theosophy, it is gnosis, it is all of these attempts of the great teachers to reveal aspects of its inexhaustible source. For truth is so vast, cannot be contained in one dogma or another. And yes, we must become liberated from dogma. I will never teach 
Kabbalah as a dogma, only as a living reality. I don't want to learn all these dogmatic things that in this way and that way and all the rest of it. For what purpose? But I do want to learn how I can cultivate better human relationships with my wife, with my sons, with my friends, with my enemies. I do want to learn how to manifest virtues instead of vices. And I don't mean suppressing my vices. I actually mean harnessing them, using them. Nothing must be wasted. In the teachings of the Tree of Life, everything is divine, and everything can be used. You may ask, how? Well, there are appropriate ways how to transmute the energy of anger into greater activity for the good of the whole. The passions of jealousy into the compassions of facilitating all and everyone. Hate into love. And so these form our raw material. You know, like the tree draws with its roots the raw material from the earth, we human beings must draw these raw materials from our instinctual nature, which is in our physical world, and make use of it to produce beautiful flowers, beautiful actions, beautiful words, beautiful creative expressions. And these raw materials, the person who has many of them is very rich. Just like a land that has lots of raw materials is also considered to be rich. And so if you discover in your nature that you get angry a lot and you have jealousies and you have passions and so on, do not despair. These are your own materials. Appropriate knowledge and a little bit of effort, appropriate guidance can accelerate and turn those energies into powerful, useful, manifested sparks of illumination for the world. And yes, it is possible to do that. Not tomorrow, not in some other lifetime, today. And you can begin today. You can begin today to become a true king, a true queen in your kingdom. On this symbol of the tree of life, we are talking about ten spheres. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. These ten spheres represent ten faculties or ten aspects of consciousness. And the top sphere is known as the crown. And the bottom sphere as is known as the kingdom. So who wears a crown? A queen and a king. Is that not true? Now you are to become a king or a queen in your world, in your kingdom. What is your kingdom? The place where you live. In the first place, this is your kingdom. In the second place is the room or the house in which you live. And you have to learn what is appropriate to manifest in your kingdom. Surely appropriate order is one of the things. Is your kingdom ordered? When you as a king or a queen declare that you will do something, do you actually fulfill it? Or do you make intentions but not realize them? Do you make promises that you break them? If you do, then you are not being a true king. There is disorder in your kingdom. That's why St. Paul said, Oh, I see one kind of response within my members of my mind and another within my body. And there is war within my members. And I must bring peace, the Christ of peace within it. It is important to see that actually what is written in the Bible, it is also Kabbalah. That there are a lot of truths within the Bible. And you can see very simply that when we talk of uh, the Christ being born in a manger, surrounded by domesticated animals, what is being spoken about, about allegorically or symbolically is that the Christ principle cannot be born in the heart, which is the manger of mankind, of an individual, or the collective family of human beings, unless the heart is surrounded by domesticated animals, symbolically meaning by virtues rather than vices. 
because the Christ principle, as soon as it is born there, it will be devoured by the jealousies and hatreds and all the rest of it. So only domesticated animals were there. So the symbolism can be seen in relationship to our current state of affairs. You don't have to wait for a Christ or a master to come down and say to you, now my son, I have chosen you to be a great servant of the light. You can make that decision today and be a great servant of the light by truly beginning the process of transmutation and transformation and appropriate alignment and integration of your nature so that it can act as one whole. Because if your mind says, I will do this, and your feelings and emotions pulling you in a different direction, you will have conflict. And where there is conflict, you will only have children of conflict being born. More irritants, more hatreds, more jealousies, and so on. So it is important to learn to bring peace and order within our kingdom. And so the different other spheres are wisdom, understanding, mercy or benevolence, severity, beauty or harmony, victory, glory, our foundation, and our kingdom. What is our foundation? Psychologically speaking, what do you actually base the whole philosophy of your life? Is it not the belief systems that you have, your programming, your conditioning? There is creative conditioning as well as destructive or ignorant conditioning. A prejudice of one kind or another in respect of uh, whether it is black people or English people or Greek people or whatever, that is a conditioning of an inappropriate kind. It's very simple. But there can be a conditioning where it is creative and uplifting conditioning. So in the end of the day, we are talking about reprogramming our nature appropriately to respond to the call of our current times. And the call of our current times is absolutely imminent right now in every heart and mind of a human being. It is possible that it opens itself to absorb the dynamic and begin that whole process of manifestation. And time is pressing upon us. And so... Well, I would like to also see if there are any questions. I'm happy to continue, uh, but uh, I think we should give some time for some questions. Yeah. Are there any questions? Yes, sir. Yeah. So we're in a contradictory situation. Of what course. I agree with, but the main conditioning is what's out there. Hmm. Yes, a child grows up, goes to school and all the rest, he has to get a job, he has to work, he has to get so much money and so hmm. on and so on and so on. That person as an adult knows that he's got to have money. And so that is his process all the time with all the, the, the problems that come with it. To say to that person to enhance the well-being of another or others, to be your goal, hmm. which opens up all what you are saying, Mother Sarah. Mm -hmm. They don't listen. I agree with you. Can you say that again? Of material goods and gold. Hmm. Um, 
Well, what is important to also understand, really, is that uh, we already highlighted something as a truth today, which is that uh, there have been phases and times where waves of energy have been dispensed within the human family, and those that have responded may have accelerated their journey. Others who have not yet responded may have remained in, uh, if you like, if we take uh, the analogy of a class uh, in a school. You have uh, students uh, which are six formers, and you have uh, students who are actually younger. You cannot uh, teach uh, and give the morality uh, of uh, a person who is on the sixth formal, let's say, to a person who is uh, uh, in the beginning uh, in the kindergarten school. So it is to realize that potentially all human beings are actually equal, but actually in everyday living, all human beings are not equal because they all have begun their journey at different times and they all have invested their energy to unfold different qualities. Therefore, what is important for us to see is to touch the excellence that is present in every human being. And I promise you, I have dealt in my private capacity as a counselor, I have dealt with people, young people, who have no drive, who have no interest in these things that we are talking about, who are breaking houses, robbing people, and they, for somehow, some reason, they have come to me, for my, to my attention. And I have spent some time working with them. And knowing, behold, they have faced their nature, their truth, and have not gone on to carry on that life that leads to distraction, but opted for an ordinary job however difficult it is, and I have told them, when there is temptation, when there are other of your old mates and uh, calling you sissy and all sorts of other silly names because you are no longer breaking houses with them, just stay firm. Call me anytime, any place, if you need just to be reminded again of your new dynamic. And it is important that we actually give to children, to people, what is appropriate to them in the moment where they are. You have to channel their energies rather than just give them a morality that say, just be good to everybody. Well, that's very nice if you're giving it to a saint, but it's not so nice if you are saying to a criminal that that's all that he has been programmed all his life. You just say, well, go and you know, serve without any attachment to reward. This is a very high advanced statement for human beings who have really worked through the earlier stages of instinctual intelligence, then to intellectual intelligence, then to intuitive intelligence, and more advanced to a sacrificial intelligence, intelligence that sacrifices itself for the good of the whole, for it knows itself to be a part of the whole, and therefore the success of the brother is the success of the self. So that kind of morality, though it is uplifting and magnificent, it is not necessarily appropriate to be given to every human being. It must be stepped down to the appropriate level and you have to connect to the person where they stand, inspire them in what they are, and then channel that energy to the next best appropriate step for them. That way, if education was more holistic in that sense, then we will have truly children of whatever grade on the evolutionary ladder they may be, excelling at that step. And perfection truly is to excel in whatever step you are. Because I promise you, a flower like a rose being fully, a flower as a rose is as magnificently manifesting perfection and beauty and goodness as a human being who is manifesting his particular step of advanced intelligence. So it is to take all that on board and to begin to expand our consciousness and really have holistic attitudes insofar as education, then we will deal with criminals in a different way and we will deal with children in a different way. And when a child is rather full of energy and has a bit of aggression and so on, instead of actually stamping that aggression, we give it an opportunity to channel that aggression 
and express it in a more effective way. And I'm speaking to you, young man over there. Yes, I'm speaking to you. I can see you. <laughs> He's smiling. He knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay, thank you. Any other question? Yes, sir. Yes, um, I'm glad that you brought that up because it is uh, one of uh, the rather misunderstood statements and there is quite a lot of misunderstood statements in relationship to Kabbalah. Uh, another is that unless you can speak the Hebrew language, you cannot make progress if you study it. Another is that um, um, you have to be taught by a true rabbi and uh, otherwise... Uh, uh, you don't receive the pure lineage. All of these veil a hidden truth, but not in the way that they have been interpreted. I have started studying the Kabbalah much, much younger than the age of 40. And I am quite happy and feel good, thank you very much. And God willing, I will continue to feel good and do this work for as long as I am needed on this physical plane. This principle of the 40 has to do with these four walls that we have talked about and the ten spheres. Yes? There are ten spheres and we have spoken of four walls. These are the 40. Four times ten makes 40. And these are the 40 days in the wilderness and the four days. And all the principles that relate to four or 40 have to do with either the four worlds and the ten spheres in combination making the 40 or just the four worlds in themselves. So the principle behind that statement is that it is hoped that by the age of 40 a human being would have taken care of his livelihood and his uh, everyday uh, means of existence and therefore he would have placed some kind of order in his uh, world and now able to begin the process of that accelerated journey. So it was a suggestion, an appropriate suggestion, in the older days when it was given. But evolution has been accelerating, and therefore we find now children of the age of 17 and 18 earning millions and millions of pounds or dollars when... Can you remember in history evidence where 17-year-old children were being paid millions of uh, pounds a year? Well, now they are. So there has been an advancement in the whole evolutionary process, and so children are much earlier awakened to the responsibilities and to the whole responsibility of uh, uh, living a life in accordance with certain moral codes, certain kind of... Uh, um, purpose and because of that fact it is also possible that the teaching of the Kabbalah be dispensed at an earlier stage but of course it is important that we also bring to mind the caution and I want to highlight that if people pick up a book in a library who an unscrupulous writer has put uh, one or other kind of uh, practice or ritual in there, and they have a little bit of uh, weakness in terms of their psychological life, they might be just a little bit uh, uh, stressed or a little bit uh, too uh, much leaning in one direction or another, and they practice a particular ritual which by virtue of its nature brings an intensity of force or energy into their system, then that energy can power what is present in their constitution. And so the little leaning becomes a greater leaning in one direction. And so it becomes a prejudice or it becomes a breakdown if it's a mental or an emotional or whatever. So it is for that reason that that warning is given. But if we take on board a certain kind of caution and a certain kind of prudence and we don't just pick up any book and immediately practice whatever it says, but reflect upon it and see what is appropriate and perhaps share with another teacher that we have actually come to know as uh, uh, some, having some degree of wisdom and some degree of practical experience 
and only then engage with things. There are three or four different types of books. There are books that have been written by observation, observing nature, collecting facts, and writing a book. There are books that are written by inspiration. There are books which are written by revelation. And there are books which are written as an outward and visible expression of the inward and invisible at one man with the source. And each one of them demands a different kind of attention for us. And so it is with different philosophies and different systems. There are systems which were appropriate and dogmas which were appropriate to people that were living in a nomadic kind of lifestyle somewhere in the desert. And it is not appropriate to people who are living in high rises and buildings like us in London. And so we have to use a little bit of common sense, which is not as common as we think, and actually begin to apply it, yes, in everyday relationships. So thank you for that uh, question because it helped me to highlight this. Anything else? Excuse me? Yes, well, it is unfortunate that throughout the history of mankind, there have been matriarchal societies and patriarchal societies, and different systems have been tried. And, uh, of course, all of that has now changed. And women are regaining their own divine uh, uh, reality, and men are beginning to feel a little bit uh, uh, unsure about how to handle that reality. And, uh, of course, there is education that is required in that, because women gaining greater power now and uh, seeing themselves as equal and men beginning to see the reality of that and trying to accept it have somehow disturbed this whole uh, relationship where a man was meant to be chivalrous, a man was to make uh, sacrifices and allow the passage of a woman, and a woman was to serve a man. Whereas now, a, a, a man can serve the woman or vice versa because conditions, uh, because uh, careers, because the whole society has altered and changed, yes? So we need to have education as to appropriate relationships and understanding because really we are only a woman in the outer form. We are not a man in the inner form or a woman in the inner reality. I would say, rather than form. Human beings may choose to incarnate time and again in one gender. Other human beings choose and incarnate in different genders. Be a woman in one incarnation and a man in another. And that is absolutely real. And more and more, this will actually be happening. And so this whole uh, separation of the genders will only be at the level of function insofar as one provides the spark and the sperm, and the other, one is a rod and the other one is a cup. And to communicate, you need a rod and a cup. To share, you need a rod and a cup. A rod transmits and a cup receives. A rod um, manifests power and the cup holds it, and nurtures it, and expresses and creates out of it. So within the physical form, there is this reality of functions. But we must not actually attach our consciousness, whether we live in a woman body or a man body, to the form and become conditioned to act intellectually and spiritually as if we are a woman or as if we are a man. Act spiritually as a human being, as an entity, and physically as a woman or as a man. And then you will liberate yourself from these old conditions and dogmas which actually existed because of the conditions as they were in the social fabric of those times. We are breaking through them. All of these limitations are going to be fading away. And it's about time. I think that's yeah. a very appropriate moment to draw the meeting to a close. I want to thank our speaker, Yanis Peters, for a most scintillating exposition on a most dynamic divinatory system. So will you join me in thanking him in the appropriate moment. Thank you.